May that hymn truly prepare us for this morning as we listen to the message, Church is Assembly, Forsake Not the Assembling. Brethren and friends, once again, I give to you the messenger of God's word this morning, Pastor Noel Espinosa. As we have been reminded, the local electoral campaign has officially begun. That's last Friday, March 25. That means we are now being presented the campaign uh, materials of those who are running for governors down to councillors. The electoral contest in our country on the local level is more notable for its violence. It is more heated and more intense. And the reason most probably is because of the closer familiarity of the personalities who are in competition. The animosity is therefore more palpable the attacks and mudslinging much more personal. Now, there is a limited analogy to the church, but instead of a national and a local, we have in the concept of the New Testament church, the universal and the local. And it is also on the local level that conflict is most palpable. We experience its intensity and reality, but that is not to say that the universal church is all peace. On the contrary, that is war at its most consequential. How do we relate this universal church with the local church where we belong? Many local churches have had to suspend normal assembly for much of the duration of the pandemic. And thankfully, we are now at the cusp of having normal assemblies resume, God willing, next Sunday morning. And we have found it convenient to stay at home. And that is why we need to address perhaps a habit that has been formed because of that convenience, address it and remedy it now that uh, staying at home is so much more convenient. There is no need to rush preparation to leave home to attend the church assembly. And when we finally have our assembly resumed, I anticipate excuses may be ready to skip assembly. And this series is going to be concluded today and it is seeking to refresh our minds about the basic sense of the church. It is ecclesia, a term that I explained has a, as its essential component that of assembly. The first message of this series brought us to the only places in the gospels where church is used all from the lips of Jesus. And there we learn that essential church identity is an assembly in the name of Christ. What sets it apart as assembly from other assemblies is that it is assembled in the name of Christ. It is regular, it is covenant, and it is militant assembly. And then last week, based on several passages of First Corinthians, we see the significant description of coming together as a church, and that distinguishes that coming together. We can come together as brethren on other occasions, but we are not doing so as a church. There is a distinct uh, description. There is a distinct uh, essence of coming together as a church, and we learned there that the hallmark of church distinction is when coming together as gathered and united. And we will now conclude our consideration of this by thinking of that concept of the church in the New Testament as universal, but at the same time local. And we will be using two passages both from the book of Hebrews. So I invite you to turn to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10. We will read verses 19 to 27 and then jump to chapter 12 verses 22 to 25. So our first passage is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 27. Therefore, brothers or brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together or to assemble as, the, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Then jump to chapter 12, verses 22 to 25. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. I remember during my Christian days, young Christian days, I was a member of a church that rejected the universal church. And the usual argument, which I also bought into, was the concept of assembly in ecclesia. And the argument is, how can there be a universal church? How can that be a church if it does not assemble? And I thought it was a sharp argument until I studied the concept of the universal church. And the idea that that universal church does not assemble, I see now to be wrong. And I will say to that argument, oh, yes, the universal church assembles, but in a different way than we do as a local church. And that is what we will consider through this message. And my message is the local church assembly is the earthly manifestation of the universal church assembled with heavenly realities. Ang pagtitipo ng iglesyang lokal ay ang pangmundong pagpapakita ng pangkalahatang iglesyang nagtitipon sa makalangit ng mga katotohanan. The local church assembly is the earthly manifestation of the universal church assembled with heavenly realities. Now, the exhortation we find that is familiar to us in Hebrews 10.25 will apply to the local church. While the description that we read in 1222 following will apply to the universal church, that one church assembled before God. Now for the Christian, it is not a choice which church to be linked with. If you are a Christian, you must be in both. As a matter of standing, as a Christian, you already belong to the universal church, whether you know it or not, whether you are conscious of it or not, or even if you reject the doctrine of the universal church. But if you are a Christian, you still belong to the universal church. But as a matter of duty, you must belong to the local church. And both are in assembly. And there are two things, therefore, that we need to consider about the assembly of the church. The first thing is sinfulness of habitual absence from church assembly. Ang kasalanan ng nakagawi ang pagliban sa pagtitipon ng iglesia. Sinfulness of habitual absence from church assembly. And the second thing is the loftiness of heavenly union in church assembly. Ang katayugan ng makalangit na pakikiisa sa pagtitipon ng iglesia loftiness of heavenly union in church assembly. Consider first the sinfulness of habitual absence from church assembly. And the writer here refers to the habit of some. And the word habit here is used in the sense of that which is done regularly in a customary way. It is not used in the way we are using it in another sense in our Sunday school to mean that which is a thoughtless routine. On the contrary, the habit that is mentioned here is done deliberately. It is thought out. It is premeditated that the people warned in this 
passage are people who are deliberately have absenting themselves from the assembly as a matter of habit. Now, I need to explain also that the assembling that is used here as translation is the verb form for synagogue. Synagogue is the place where Jews in the Roman world at the time would meet together in a formal way. So it is talking of a formal assembly, not just gathering together. As I mentioned last week in our message, there is that gathering as a church. So the writer here is talking of not just any assembling, but rather that gathering which is stated, covenanted by the church to be assembled together. And there are those whom the writer warns of absenting themselves as a matter of habit. And the writer also mentions the assembly of the church as the culmination and the application of what he calls earlier as the new and living way opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does he call it new and living way? He is contrasting this to the old way. That is the Old Testament approach to God, which was mediated by priests. And the priests were those who oversaw the system of animal sacrifices. That was the way to approach God in the Old Testament as a matter of preparation for the fulfillment that comes in the new covenant. But now we are in the new covenant. And in the new covenant in Jesus Christ, there is now a new and living way because of his blood. There is now a new approach dependent on what Jesus Christ has done. And that remains our gospel message to you, that you cannot approach God in any other way, not through church, not through priests, not through your good works, but only through Jesus Christ and what he has done. That is the way of approach to God. That is the way of having a, a saving standing with God. But for us who know that, we are to assemble together. Church assembly is the fruit of the new way of approach to God through Christ. Ang pagtitipo ng iglesia ay bunga ng bagong daan ng paglapit sa Diyos sa pamamagitan ni Kristo. Again, in the Old Testament, originally through the tabernacle, then more permanently in the temple since Solomon, not everybody can enter into the holy precinct of the tabernacle or the temple. Only priests were allowed to do so. And when priests entered, they must have fit offerings and animal sacrifices for themselves and for the people for ceremonial cleansing. In other words, they could not just draw near at any time they wished. There were mandated times and there were mandated sacrifices for them to offer. So just imagine the constraints. It's not anywhere but in Jerusalem from the time of the temple. And it's not anywhere in Jerusalem but the temple. And then it's not just anybody but priests. And it is not just any time but at mandated times. But all these were preparation for the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now, the writer says we have a new and living way, no longer by priests, no longer by system of animal sacrifices, no longer at uh, particular precincts of a physical tabernacle or temple. We are now to assemble together and we draw near to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you even realize the great privilege that is? You need not be a priest with a priestly garment. We believe in what is called the priesthood of all believers. There are no clerical priests today. Jesus Christ is our high priest, but we have no office of priesthood in the church. The pastor is not a priest. I do not mediate between God and sinners. We are all on equal level as far as approach to God is concerned. What a great privilege we should take that as our blessing. If you have Christ, the privilege of only a few in the Old Testament is now your privilege to draw near to God himself. 
and in saying that, the writer is making a very big statement that should mean a big deal to Christians he was writing to. And he was writing to Christians who were Jews in their previous religious faith, but because of suffering for the Christian faith, some of them were backsliding into Judaism. And the argument of the writer basically in his letter to the Hebrews is now that you are so much better in many ways, and he catalogs the better ways that have come to be because of Jesus Christ. Christ is superior to angels. Christ is better than the Aaronic priesthood. Christ is the better sacrifice and so forth and so on. Now that we have something better, much better in Christ, why go back to the constraints of Judaism? Why go back again to the mediated worship by priests and animal sacrifices? And the most powerful display of this better way is the assembly of the church. Everybody now can draw near to God. Any believer in the right spirit should take this to heart as a great blessing to join the assembly. When you are in the assembly of the people of God in the local church, you are telling and shouting to the world, we have this better way. We are now drawing near to God, not by any human priest, but only by the high priestly office of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the most unfortunate tragedy besets those who have the habit of absenting from church assembly. This is unfortunately true of every church, that there will be people, instead of counting it a privilege, they feel heavy, they feel heavy due to what they think is inconvenience. Do you know what Jesus Christ has done to create this new and living way? The writer says, instead of animal blood sprinkled on the altar, we are now sprinkled with the blood cleansing, by the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our new way. We come through Christ. The church here is compared to a temple, and in many significant New Testament passages, it shows that the church indeed is a better temple. One such, one such text, Ephesians 2.21, Paul says, In Christ the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Oh, you do not expect the Old Testament temple to be growing. It was a permanent structure. And in fact, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. But here is the wonder of the church assembly. You can see it growing because it is not a physical structure of uh, golden materials. It is of people whose common profession is that they are cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they assemble together, it is a powerful display of what Christ has done to create this new and living way. How dare us absent ourselves from the assembly as a matter of habit? You go back to the Old Testament and imagine an Israelite invited to join inside a temple. Now, do you think he would rush to the temple? No, he would be in fear. Because if he's not a priest, he's not allowed at all to enter into the holy place, much less into the most holy place. And even if he were a priest, he would still be conscious that he could not draw near any time. There are mandated times. And he could just draw near by himself. He must have fit sacrifice for himself and for those he represented. That would be the reaction of a pious Jew, a pious Israelite in the Old Testament. But here are New Testament saints who have the freedom and privilege to do so. That there should be no fear. That we can have the confidence of approaching God and we display it in the assembly 
of the people of God. And yet, the writer refers to those who have the habit of neglecting such a powerful display of what Christ has done by being absent. We have seen this happen before when there is a concert to be held, let's say, in Araneta of a favorite diva or a music band. Some fans will buy very pricey tickets just to have a close view of their favorite diva or band. And we are not talking here of a diva. We're not talking here of a band. We are talking here of our triune God who invites us and summons us into his presence. Now we can do so without the complications of mediated priesthood and animal sacrifices. We can draw near through that one and new and living way in Jesus Christ. And my challenge to you, even as we begin our assembly in the morning next Lord's Day, weigh the gravity of sin in deliberate and regular absence from church assembly. Timbangin mo ang bigat ng kasalanan na sinasadya at tuwi ng pagliban sa pagtitipon ng iglesia. Our text in verse 26 reveals the gravity of that sin. It's one of the five warnings in Hebrews, and students of the letter to the Hebrews understand that there are these scattered five warnings. This is the force. And it speaks of the gravity of that sin of absenting from the assembly. The writer warns if we go on sinning deliberately. And the sin that he has just mentioned is absenting as a habit from church assembly. And if you go on sinning deliberately and he shows the gravity of it. Now I'm choosing my words carefully. No one is begrudged of the reality of occasional inability to attend. Probably you are sick. Probably there is a necessity that you did not arrange yourself that occasional inability is not of your own desire or making but maybe helpless helplessly thrust upon you and we are not begrudging that we all have to be absent occasionally but if you are free to attend but choose to absent yourself and do something else avoidable consider the gravity of it the writer here uses the word for neglecting the very same word used by Paul in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10 about Demas in love with this present world has deserted me. And this is what we are doing by habitual absence. We are deserting our brethren because we are in love with this present world. You are slapping away the gently proffered hand of invitation of Jesus to partake of what he earned by his death. And by his cross, he has done away with temple restrictions for priests only. Now all believers may draw near, but you are slapping that away. What is it that disables you from attending the assembly? Because you need to wake up earlier, that you have to let go of the convenience of your home. And for some, probably because you need to earn extra for that day. It's like saying, I do not care that Jesus died on the cross to pave a new and living way. I have extra money to earn, even if this is the Lord's day. Alas, we live in a generation of consumers. And a Gen Z where gadgets are everything that defines them. And believers must stand above all this. We tell the world we embrace Christ's new way. And the way we do that is we assemble. 
on this date, March 27, year 1667, John Milton published his Paradise Lost. John Milton was perhaps the most famous Puritan poet, and his Paradise Lost is considered as one of the best epics of literature. Less known is the sequel to that, which is Paradise Regained. And that is the story of the Christian life. Because of Adam, we lost paradise. We lost Eden. We lost our standing with God. But in Christ, the last Adam, we have paradise regained. And we are displaying that. We have this paradise by assembling together is assembly in the church something of a paradise to you or is it something of an inconvenience we need to make a decision and i trust that we see the sinfulness of habitual absence from church assembly but let us look at the opposite as we consider chapter 12 the loftiness of heavenly union in church assembly ang katayugan ng makalangit na pakikisa sa pagtitipon ng iglesia. Hebrews 12 contrasts still the two approaches to God, but this time it applies to what it calls the general assembly, what we call in theology the universal church. And the contrast is between two mountains. One is Sinai where the law was given to Moses, and there is what the writer calls that warning from earth. But now the contrast is we are approaching through Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the hallmark of Jerusalem. And in approaching it, we come not to thunders and lightnings of Sinai, but to the heavenly realities. That is where the universal church assembles with the heavenly realities the church assembly activates the union of god's people on earth with heavenly realities so when we are gathered as a local church we are also gathered with the universal church on earth ang pagtitipo ng iglesia ay nagpapaaktibo sa ating pakikiisa sa mga tao ng Diyos sa buong mundo kasama ng mga katotohanan ng makalangit in fact there are nine categories of heavenly realities that are all active when the church assembles and it is not my purpose to expound these nine categories one by one but just consider it says we are coming to God. We are coming to Jesus, the better mediator. We are even coming with angels and spirits of just men made perfect. Even in, in fact, those who already are in the intermediate state. It does assemble with realities more than we could ever do in a strictly local church assembly. Now, one description that is significant here is that of festal assembly, a reminder of the assembly for annual festivals in Israel. But now we do every Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day, we have a festal assembly. And perhaps you cannot notice it with your physical eyes in a small gathering that we would do. But in reality, when the church assembles, the church assembles with that great assembly of the general assembly of the church, the church universal, and it is a festal assembly. There is an innumerable company that assembles together with the one universal church. But you may ask, where, where in the world is that assembly before God? That's the point. God, as he looks from his heavenly throne, see his people on the Lord's day from every part of the earth, divided perhaps by meridians and time zones. But when they gather on the Lord's day, God can see because the earth is but a speck in his eyes. And when they gather, the Lord is pleased with the gathering of his people as the full Lord's day while the earth rotates is occupied with faithful people in assembly and that is what you are 
withdrawing from I found the universal church as one of the most liberating doctrines I have accepted steeped as I was in local church exclusivism but because of the universal church doctrine I all the more appreciate the local church not only my own but in all the world that is why there is no assembly like that of the church on earth even if there are only two or three in the local church, as Jesus said, there am I in the midst of them, and those two or three are gathered with all these nine categories of heavenly realities. How can you believe in such an assembly with regular and deliberate habit of absenting yourself? You know, in sports, and I know more of basketball than any other sport. Some players have a star complex. They do not attend team practice and they uh, only show up when there is a stadium games. And now in most tournaments, there is a disciplinary measure for such absenteeism. They cannot join the stadium game if they are not attending team practice because team practice does not have the glory of fans attendance. We should not have a star complex. We should be mindful of our duty as covenant assembly with the church. My challenge therefore to you as a final challenge of this brief series is remember in church assembly, activate your faith in the eternal more than the temporal. Sa pagtitipo ng iglesia, gawin mong aktibo ang iyong pananampalataya sa pangwalang hanggan higit kaysa pansamantala. In all the categories that the writer mentions, we draw near in church assembly, none is of mere earthly temporary thing. Now, this is not to say that the church is relevant to the earthly concerns of the believer, not at all. But we are so immersed already in the earthly for six days. Are you not weary? Are you not going to seek for the joy of rest? And rest is not in activity. It is rather activating that which often is inactive during the six days, thoughts of eternity. And those who will habitually absent from the assembly, we can only conclude, live for the temporary. They find little or no relevance for eternity and their minds are full of earthly and temporary concerns and there is nothing wrong with your load and there is nothing wrong doing your best in vocation. We advocate for that. But remember, there is an eternity. I told you that the word used for assembling in 1025 is the verb form for synagogue. There is only one other place in the New Testament where that is similarly used. And that is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, where Paul refers to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are being gathered together to him. That's the same word for assembly, meeting together. So you are meeting together here on earth and the only other counterpart of it is when Christ comes again and we will be gathered with him forevermore. So how can you if you are yearning for that, be neglectful of the church assembly. And the writer's reinforcement back to 1025 is do not neglect the assembling of ourselves together all the more as you see the day. No, the day in the singular is the New Testament way of referring to the final day of the last days which we are now in. Unfortunately, some choose only to live for the days, plural, and they 
have no mind for the day. You see, it is the Lord's day that reminds us of that day, the final of these present days. And that is what you and I need. We do not begrudge your labors of the six days. But God is so good to give us the Lord's day. God is so good through the Lord Jesus Christ to give us a new and living way. And when we are gathered there, we are again displaying to the world that we are people of eternity and we are telling the world how to join that eternity. Much of the resurgence of Reformed theology from the last few decades of the 20th century is still ongoing by God's blessing today is credited to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and through his many writings. Now, what we must understand is that most of those writings were originally messages in the assembly of the Westminster Chapel, where he pastored until his retirement in 1968. And then it was put into writing. This is the potential of a church assembly. And now we will have that assembly in the morning again, God willing, next Lord's Day. I started preaching from this lonely office on August 2, 2020. And by God's blessing, it continued every Sunday as I could remember without any skipping. And as much as I will miss this, there is no substitute for the assembly of the church. So I am willing to leave this behind to be in assembly with you. And I hope you have the same yearning because we love the church of God. And that is the response him we will offer to the Lord I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode, the church, our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. Let us sing, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Let us close in prayer. Our great God and gracious Heavenly Father, as we have sung, the brightest glories earth can yield. And yet, Alas, for our short-sightedness that we often do not see it that way when the church assembles. There is more pomp and human glory in the gathering of politics, of business, and many other human concerns in entertainment. But there is nothing as glorious as the assembly of the local church. So grant, Lord, that we may refresh our minds with a thought that this is the fruit of what the Lord Jesus has done, creating for us a new and living way so that we may draw near no longer through human priests, but all of us as those in union with Jesus Christ may draw near to you. We pray for those who are still outside of this privilege of drawing near to you in union with Christ, that they may realize that there is no other way but they cannot draw near to you by their good works or religion. The only way is the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have learned of this way and have appropriated it for us and now are members of the church, we pray that we may truly display the greatness of this new and living way. Every time we assemble, there is glory in it. And that glory is because we are the manifestation of that one universal church on earth that on the Lord's day, assemble before your very presence that you can see as one assembly on the Lord's day from different time regions and zones yet gathered before the throne of God and of the land. And we pray that we may esteem highly this assembly of the church even as we are anticipating to begin our morning assemblies once again next Lord's Day, may it materialize, and when we are able to assemble again, may we truly 
exercise both the resolve, the discipline, and have the yearning for the assembly of the church and sense its glory. Yes, it is still the assembly of many who struggle with sin, and yet before your eyes are covered by the atoning blood sprinkled, which is that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us to prepare ourselves, resolved to be disciplined in assembling together, conscious of the great privilege that is ours, and always do so to glorify you and to display to the world that glory through Jesus Christ. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of his Son, the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.